ادع الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادله بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله و... بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters in islam may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his mercy and blessings upon all of you and descend tranquility upon this gathering and make us from amongst his obedient servants and mention us in the heavens amongst his angels Inshallah, today we're going to be going over the tafsir of Surah Al-Masad, the 111th chapter in the Qur'an, in which we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aids His Prophet and brings victory to His Prophet, who was slandered by his uncle Abu Lahab and some false propaganda about the Prophet's message and some mockery was directed towards the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself responded to these false accusations and this falsehood and the propaganda that Abu Lahab was trying to propagate in the early times in Islam in Mecca. So the scholars have mentioned that Surah Al-Masad, Surah Al-Masad was the sixth surah in the order of revelation and that it was revealed after Surat Al-Fatiha and before Surat At-Takwir, which all are Meccan surahs. And as you all know, a Meccan surah or a Meccan verse are those surahs or verses which were revealed before the migration of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam from Mecca to Medina. And Medini surahs or Medini verses were the verses and surahs which were revealed after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam from Mecca to Medina. So this surah that we're dealing with today, Surah Al-Masad, is a Meccan surah. And some of the scholars have mentioned a couple names for this surah, but the most popular name which we find in many of the Musahif and many of the books of Tafsir and many of the explanations of the meanings of the Qur'an is Surah Al-Masad. Other scholars have mentioned Surah Abi Lahab, Surah Tabbat, and Surah Lahab. Surah Lahab. And this surah is different than some of the surahs which come after it because it doesn't start off with the imperative form of قُلْ say as we have in قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ in قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ and subhanAllah there is some wisdom and hikmah behind this if we think and ponder over the topic and theme of this surah and how it is related to mentioning the story of the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, who was Abu Lahab, who was slandering him and telling even the Prophet's other relatives not to accept his message. That normally when you want to give someone advice, you want to give one of your close relatives or friends advice, if you order them or give them in the command form or the imperative form, sometimes they might not accept it as easily as if it comes in an informative type form or a different type of manner. And this is the miracle of the Qur'an is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses every single group of individuals in the best of ways with the type of speech which is most suitable to them in that certain situation, in that place and at that time. So we see here that the surah, it starts off with tabbat. Tabbat yada abi wa And subhanAllah, I was thinking and pondering and contemplating over this that the same way and the same harshness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed towards Abu Lahab who spread propaganda and started slandering and mocking the Prophet, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the same, subhanAllah, similar to the way that we recite the surah. As though we are conveying also the message that Abu Lahab will perish. Because in the surah you will find that every verse ends with a, a letter from the huruf 
Al-Qalqala. Right? Min huruf al-Qalqala. And the huruf al-Qalqala are five. Contained in the statement that the scholars of Tajweed say, Qutbu Jad. Qutbu Jad. Qaf, Ta, Ba, Jim, Dal. So anytime a word ends with these letters, then you will pronounce it kind of kind of strongly with some takalluf and a tajdeed so inshallah let's listen to the recitation of how this surah inshallah should be recited and then we'll go into exploring some of the meanings and guidance contained in these verses a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, the translation of the meanings, Perished be the hands of Abu Lahab. Perished be the hands of Abu Lahab and may he be perished as well. مَا أَغْنَ عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ His wealth and all of his worldly adornments and all that he accumulated in this world as well as his children will not benefit him at all. Not in this world nor in the hereafter. Sayasla naran thatalahab and he will be burnt in a fire of blazing flames. Wamraatuhu Hamma Latal Hatab. And not only him but his wife as well who used to carry wood and used to carry falsehood and false tales and rumors about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fiji Diha Habalum Mim Masa and in her neck is a twisted rope of Masad, a twisted rope of Masad. So, first of all, let's start off with discussing some of the Asbab and Nuzul, some of the reasons and causes for the dissension and revelation of these verses. And we have three, we have three statements which have been mentioned in some of the books of Tafsir and some of the books of Hadith. And the first one, which Al Tabari mentioned in his Tafsir on the authority of Abdurrahman ibn Zayd. He said, mentions a story that Abu Lahab, he went to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him. He said, O Muhammad, what will I gain if I, or what will I gain or receive if I believe in you, O Muhammad? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa replied, he said, the same that the other individuals who accept Islam receive. Then Abu Lahab, he said, he said, nothing extra, I will receive nothing extra, nothing more. So then the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ responded, he said, He said, well what are you seeking Abu Lahab? What are you expecting? What do you want? What do you want to receive for accepting Islam? Do you want some money? Do you want some wealth? Do you want women? Do you want this? Do you want that? So then Abu Lahab, he said, he said, may this religion perish. And may you perish. What type of religion is this? That me... And those people, those poor impoverished people who have accepted Islam in Mecca, how can me, the great wealthy Abu Lahab, and them be considered as equal? Then these verses were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ as a response to him. So that's the first narration that we have, mentioning the causes and reasons of dissension. The second one has been narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. He said that when the verse, the verse... وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ That when this verse was revealed, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Prophet Muhammad sallam to warn his relatives and warn his, his, his people and his tribes and his close, his close relatives and his family members, when this verse was revealed, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ascended on Mount Safa, on Jabal al-Safa. He ascended on that mountain and he called out, to all of the tribes in Mecca, he said, Ya Sabaha. He says, O Arabs, O people. And this Ya Sabaha was an Arabic expression used by the Arabs to warn 
people from danger or to call them to gather together to listen to some type of message or to draw the people together to get their attention. So all of the tribes who heard the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu calling out gathered at the bottom of Mount Safa. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to them, he says, what would you all say if I informed you that soldiers and cavalrymen were coming to invade us from behind this mountain? Would you all believe me? So then they all replied, they says, yes, O Muhammad, we have never known you to be a liar. We have never heard you tell a lie. You are the truthful one. So then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to them, indeed I am warning you from a severe punishment of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So then once they heard this, Abu Lahab, he stood up and he raised his voice and he said, may you perish, O Muhammad. Is this what you gathered us for? This is the message that you called out and you gathered us for to tell us about this. So then the verses in this surah, Surah Al-Masid, were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as a response to Abu Lahab's comments and actions. And the last mention that we have as regards to the, the reasons and causes of revelation is what Imam Qurtubi mentions in his tafsir on the authority of Abdurrahman ibn Maysan that any time a group of people, any time a group of people would come to Mecca to meet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Lahab would, would intercept them and cut off their path before they would reach the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they would ask Abu Lahab, they would say, "Well, hey, you're the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You're his relative. You are the most knowledgeable of Muhammad. So tell us about him." So Abu Lahab would say, "Yes, Muhammad is a liar and a magician." So then the caravans would leave and they would not get the chance to hear from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. So then one day another caravan came to Mecca to meet the Prophet and they met Abu Lahab in their path. And this caravan they refused to leave until they met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and told Abu Lahab they says we're not leaving until we see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and hear his voice. So Abu Lahab would tell them he would say listen we're still trying to cure and remedy the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu from the craziness that has overtaken him and he will perish and die soon and he will be humiliated. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu heard this, he became very sad and very depressed until these verses were revealed, perishing Abu Lahab and perishing all of his evil deeds and all of the false propaganda that he was spreading about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So this surah, contains aid directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anyone who tries to slander or spread false propaganda of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the first of them was Abu Lahab the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and subhanallah brothers and sisters if we were to ponder and look open up the Quran open up your Quran and look at the order of the surahs in the Quran. Look at the order of the surahs of the Quran. Look where a masad is. Look at the surah before it, Surat and Nasr. The surah before Surat al Masad is called Surat al Nasr, which can be translated as the help, the aid, or the victory. So the help, the aid, and the victory. This surah is mentioned before Surat al Masad, and then the, the surah after Surat al Masad is what? Surat al Ikhlas. Or Surat at tawheed So, Subhanallah, I was sitting and thinking and pondering. It's as though Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is this Surah Surat al Masjid comes between two Surahs, comes between the aid in the victory, the aid in the victory that was given to the Muslims, and it is as if the aid and victory against Abu Lahab that was mentioned. And Surah Al-Masad and all of Allah's enemies who slander the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is from who? Is from Surah Al-Ikhlas and from the author of Surah Al-Ikhlas from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, which contains right Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's most beautiful names and beautiful attributes. So it is as though Allah gave the Muslims victory that He mentioned in Surah Al-Nasr in Mecca, 
and that he will defeat all enemies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we see in Surah Al-Ikhlas. So it is as if Allah is saying that the nasr of anybody propagating falsehood against the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will come from Allah subhanahu wa taala Himself. And another benefit from this surah and from the Quran in general is that when we look at the Quran and we see and observe those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dispraised in the Quran from amongst the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa enemies that we find that the characteristics of the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa are mentioned in general except Abu Lahab and except his wife but why is that brothers and sisters number one Abu Lahab and his wife were openly slandering and mocking and talking bad about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu while warning his own relatives about his message and about accepting his message. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself aided his Prophet against that evil enemy and slanderer of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi even though he was from amongst the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu relatives. Secondly, the Abu Lahab was the Prophet's uncle and one of his close relatives. So Allah mentioned his name and his most popular name, his kunya, in which he was most popularly known by, so that none of his other relatives would be influenced and affected by the false doubts that Abu Lahab was spreading about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now let's get down and, and break down some of the, the, the verses and the linguistic meanings inshallah and, and and also the technical meanings the religious meanings and how we can understand them inshallah so we'll start off where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says tabbat 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 scholars have mentioned five different meanings for this okay and they all revolve around the same thing meaning loss misguidance being destroyed or being perished or becoming zero some of the the meanings that the scholars have mentioned are khabat 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 meaning to lose, to go somewhere and return with nothing. Other scholars, ballat, ballat, that the hands of Abu Lahab are misguided, as well as his actions, as well as Abu Lahab himself. Halakat, halakat, that Abu Lahab, his actions, his hands and himself will all be destroyed. Safirat, safirat meaning his hands and everything that he acquired in this dunya will become zero, become nothing. And lastly, some of the scholars have mentioned khasirat. Khasirat means that he will attain loss. He will attain loss. Then Allah he says, Tabbat yada abi laha bin watab. Tabbat yada abi laha bin watab. Yada means two hands. Yadun, yadun. Yadun means one. Yada means two hands. So may the two hands of Abu Lahab perish and be destroyed and be at loss and they are misguided. So here we have the meaning, right? Sometimes in the Arabic language, قَدْ يُعَبِّرْ عَنَ النَّفْسِ بِالْيَدِ Right? Sometimes the word, right? The, 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 the self or the individual can be expressed by meaning the word, by using the word yad. Because, why is that? It is because the hands are what put forth the deeds. The hands are what put forth most of our deeds, the good deeds and the bad deeds. So we will be judged by the good deeds or the bad deeds that we put forth by our hands. So some of the scholars have said that it means, right, the nafs of Abu Lahab, not only his hands will perish, but also him himself will perish. Other scholars have said the amal of Abi Lahab, right, the actions of Abi Lahab will perish as well. The actions of Abi Lahab will perish as well. So who was Abu Lahab? Who was Abu Lahab? Abu Lahab, as we mentioned, he was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So he was the son of Abdul Muttalib. He was the son of Abdul Muttalib and the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi whose name was Abdul Uzza. Abdul Uzza, the servant of Uzza. And Uzza was an idol which the Arab polytheists used to worship in Mecca. And he was called Abu Lahab because it was mentioned that his face was very was glowing. His face was very bright and glowing and his teeth as well. When he would smile, he would talk, his teeth were very glowing and they were they were very bright. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention 
Abu Lahab's nickname, or as we call in Arabic, Kunya. Why did Allah mention Abu Lahab, his Kunya, and not mention his real name? Number one, because he was more popularly known and more well known by Abu Lahab. Everybody knew him by Abu Lahab. Secondly, because his name was Abdul Uzza. His name was the servant of Uzza, servant of the idol Uzza. And Allah, He chose not to address him with this name so as not to dignify him or honor him as someone who was a servant of, of an idol. Thirdly, because subhanAllah, when you call someone by their real name, this is more honorable and this is more dignified than their kunya. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He called out to the prophets, He always called out to them using their names to dignify them and honor them and give them a level of high respect. So Allah didn't use Abu Lahab's name so as not to give him dignity or honor or respect. So why did Allah use the word tabbat and then tabba in the first verse? Number one, we can say for emphasis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to emphasize that not only will Abu Lahab's hands perish, but Abu Lahab as well will perish and all of his actions and deeds that he put forth and all that he accumulated from amongst his wealth and his children will perish as well. Similarly, that tabbat, he will perish in this world and also perish in the hereafter as well with another punishment. Other scholars have said that it's emphasizing the fact that not only will he perish, but also his offspring as well will perish. So what have Abu Lahab's hands perished from? First of all, Tawheed, from accepting the message of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and the message of all the prophets and messengers, starting from Adam and ending with the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, the message of Islamic monotheism. Secondly, they were perished and prohibited from accepting the message of his own nephew, his own relative, the Prophet Muhammad, by following the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and accepting that he was a messenger of Allah. And thirdly, they were perished and were prohibited from all types of goodness. So then Allah, He goes on to say, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبُ So his wealth, Abu Lahab's wealth, as well as his children will not save him at all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. And it was known that Abu Lahab, he had a lot of animals, he had a lot of livestock, as well as a lot of wealth that he inherited from his relatives in Mecca, and also he had a lot of earnings. So none of that will benefit him. As well as, as Allah he says, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ His wealth and earnings will not benefit him. As well as مَا كَسَبْ As well as everything that he has earned. Number one, and from the worst things that he has earned is from his evil actions. His slander, his mocking and trying to harm the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, And as well as his children. His children will not benefit him as well. And the Prophet Muhammad wasallam as mentioned in the hadith that awladukum min kasbikum that your children or your offspring are considered to be from amongst your earnings and some of the scholars have mentioned a story which imam hakim and mustadrak mentioned and imam dhahabi agreed with him upon the authenticity of it and ibn hajar mentioned that it is hasan and fath al-bari that one of abu lahab's sons either his name was utba or utiba or utayba was one of the fiercest enemies of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, like his father Abu Lahab. And it's mentioned that when some verses in the Quran, in Surah Al-Najm, when Najmi Ida Hawa, that when the star, by the star, and when it vanishes, when this verse was revealed, and then the first 10 or 20 verses of Surah Al-Najm were revealed, this son of Abu Lahab, he said, I disbelieved in the star when it vanishes. And I disbelieved when Jibreel came close to you, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and may spit, tuf, may spit be upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wherever he goes and wherever his message reaches, even if it is to Sham. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard this, he made dua against him, asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to send one of his creatures to eat him. And he was killed by a lion and his head was crushed, and he was ripped to pieces. The Prophet made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Allahumma sallat alayhi kalban min kilabik. Oh Allah, make, send one of your creatures 
from amongst your dogs, as you could literally translate it. But here, a kalb can also be used to mean a creature, or here specifically to mean a lion, because it was mentioned that a lion ripped this individual, Utba or Utiba, the son of Abu Lahab, into pieces and and and, and just mazzaqahu kulla mazzaq and ripped him up and and, 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 and crushed his head and, and, and broke him up into so many different pieces all from the, 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 the result of slandering the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and from the dua of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and Allah aiding his Prophet against all of those enemies and those who try to f- spread false propaganda and mock the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until even we find some lines of poetry from Hassan ibn Thabit who said مَنْ يَرْجَعُ الْعَامَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَمَا أُكِيلَ السَّبْعِ بِالْرَاجِعِ That the one who is returning, the, the one who فَمَنْ يَرْجَعُ الْعَامَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ who, The one who is returning this year to his family, then he will return. But the one who was eaten by the wild animal, he is not returning to his family. So we see even Hassan ibn Thabit, he mentioned in some verses of poetry about this occurrence and about this 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 incident. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he goes on to say Sayasla Naran Lahab that Abu Lahab will be burned in a fire with blazing flames. So why did Allah mention the the harf scene here? Harf is seen for what? As you all know, brothers and sisters who have studied the Arabic language Harf is seen is used for what? For the future, right? For the future, istiqbal, right? Either to be used for the future, meaning the close future, right? We have two words in the Arabic language which can be annexed to present tense verbs, such as, uh, excuse me, seen, okay? And then we have sofa, which is detached, which is detached, with both, with both, which both mean the future, which both mean the future. Seen, the scholars have mentioned, means the immediate future. And sofa means the future which is which is far away. So also the word seen or the letter seen can also mean al-wa'id, right? A promise that he is going to receive the hellfire for what he has done. So why was the word yasla? Why was the word yasla used here? Number one, yasla means it's fuel for the hellfire. Being wood and coals for the hellfire. So not only will the fire disintegrate him, and not only is yasla or salla the description of the hellfire, but it's also a description of Abu Lahab in the hellfire. So it is as if he is burnt so much that it is as though... Him and the hellfire become as one. So then Allah he goes to mention, Sayasla Naran Vatalahab, Naran Vatalahab, that the fire will be so hot and so powerful, filled with blazing flames. And subhanAllah, if you think about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same words from Abu Lahab's kunya to talk about and describe the fire, Lahab meaning that they will be flaming up and they will be bright and they will be blazing. Just how the people used to say about Abu Lahab and his face. So there are two important things in this verse. One, that there is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Abu Lahab will be in the hellfire. And that number two, Allah is telling us that Abu Lahab will die upon disbelief. So this takes us to another principle about witnessing or mentioning that somebody is in the hellfire or somebody is in the paradise. Brothers and sisters in Islam, it is not upon the Muslim to bear witness that this person is from amongst the people of paradise or that person is from amongst the people of hellfire except with a clear, cut, decisive, nas proof text from the Quran or from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to mention in the verse after that وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ And also his wife, his wife who used to carry the wood, the prickers and thorns and used to lay them 
in the path of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at night to harm him and cause the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, grief and difficulties. So her name was Umm Jamil, the daughter of Harb ibn Umayyah, the sister of Abi Sufyan. So what did she used to do? She used to gather thorns and prickers and put them in the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's path. Also, she used to mock and make fun of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, saying he was poor and impoverished and that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam used to gather wood. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mocked her in the same way that she was mocking the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And third, the scholars have mentioned that she used to gather foul speech. She used to gather slander and rumors about the Prophet Muhammad So the one who spreads rumors and spreads falsehood and propaganda about others is also called in Arabic Hammal Hatab is the one who carries wood, the one who carried thorns because they the rumors and propaganda and falsehood they start and ignite enmity and hatred between people similarly as wood does to fire. Other scholars have said, why was she called, right? Because she has gathered up and what she has gathered up from sins for mocking and speaking bad about the Prophet Muhammad So the sins that she gathered are like wood that will be thrown with her in the hellfire to burn eternally. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last verse he goes on to say, masad," And in her neck is a twisted rope of masad. So some of the scholars have mentioned, they says, they said, right, it's been uh, attributed to Ibn Abbas and other uh, companions and tabi'een as well, that masad is a chain, a chain of iron that will be fed in through the mouth of this wife of Abu Lahab and come out of her backside and then the remaining part of the chain will be wrapped around her neck as Allah mentions in the Quran that the length of which right the length of which the chain will be 70 dhira 70 dhira will be a very long chain and this chain will go in through her mouth and come out of her backside and be wrapped around her neck and this will be her punishment in the hellfire other scholars have mentioned that al masad right masad is a rope of palm fiber right? a ro- rope of palm fiber in this world and it will be a rope of fire in the hereafter around her neck some of the scholars have mentioned that it is a tree from amongst the trees in yemen other scholars have mentioned that it is a chain of jewelry that the wife of Abu Lahab used to wear around her neck and that she used to say that I will spend the value, the gold value or the silver value, I will spend the value of this, whatever this necklace is worth, I will spend that to oppose the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his message. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish her justly similarly to what she was trying to spend in this world to stop the message of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Allah will punish her with that similar thing wrapped around her neck in the hellfire. So this surah it contains many many benefits and this is the first instance of where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala one of the first instances where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala addresses directly those who try to slander and mock the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and this surah also contains some of the miracles to prove that the Quran is the revelation from Allah and that it is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we have that in the third verse that Abu Lahab will be burnt in a blazing fire. So if this surah wasn't from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would never mention this about his relatives. He would never mention that one of his own relatives, one of his uncles will be from the inhabitants of the hellfire because there is a possibility that maybe he could have accepted Islam later on, whether in Medina or later on in the Meccan period. And it also opens up the door for the possibility of people slandering the Prophet Muhammad because he, if Abu Lahab did accept Islam, 
then the Prophet Muhammad would have been accused of lying, saying that his uncle was eternally in the hellfire. So Abu Lahab, he died upon disbelief, and he died upon his, 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 his evil actions and deeds, and he is from amongst the people who are promised the hellfire, and he is in the hellfire, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this surah. Some other benefits we can extract from this surah, brothers and sisters, is that it mentions... It mentions one of the categories of spouses that Allah mentions in the Quran. We have different categories of spouses mentioned in the Quran. For example, Abu Lahab and his wife. What were they? They were both disbelievers. Ibrahim alayhi salam and his wife, Hajar. They were both what? Believers. So we have categories of spouses who were believers, categories of spouses who were disbelievers. Then we have Fir'aun. And his wife, Asiya, Fir'aun was a disbeliever and his wife was a believer. And then we have Nuh alayhi salam and his wife. Nuh was a believer and from the best of prophets and messengers and his wife was a disbeliever. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from what we heard today and enable us to practice the sublime and supreme guidance contained in the Quran and whatever we mentioned which is the truth is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever we mentioned which is incorrect or false is from myself and from the shaitan and I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any mistakes that were made now and forever thank you for joining us today may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu